Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Kevin Mosher. I am uh, pleased to present to you the, uh, uh, this webinar, seminar presentation, um, not in person since we are under uh, COVID-19 orders around the country. Um, so hopefully this will uh, work. And definitely if you have any questions, I'll provide my contact information. We can definitely talk about questions that you might have through email or uh, phone calls, that sort of thing. But I wanted to, um, t so today we are going to go over the ADA, uh, top to bottom responsibilities that employers have under the ADA. And, um, you know, after the next hour and a half of, uh, of this training, I am, I am certain that you are all going to be, um, you know, top flight ADA uh, supervisors, managers, and HR professionals with serious knowledge of the ADA and all the great stuff that the ADA um, brings to the table. So uh, again, my name is Kevin Mosher. I'm an HR attorney, uh, MSBA certified specialist, as it says right, right there. And um, I uh, work on HR all day long. So ADA is definitely something I do a lot of. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? So we are going to, we are just going to focus on the, on the Americans with Disabilities Act. A lot of states have their own state laws. Um, we're not going to talk about those. We are just going to focus on the federal law and what the federal law requires. We are going to focus on what it means to be disabled and what it doesn't mean to be disabled. We are going to talk about the employer's responsibilities regarding disabled employees and applicants as well. A lot of employers misunderstand the ADA to only apply to employees, and that is just not the case. Uh, the ADA equally applies to applicants. It's slightly different with regard to applicants than it is with employees. You have more responsibilities and requirements as an employer with regard to employees themselves, but there definitely are provisions in the ADA that require that we accommodate employees who, I'm um, sorry, applicants uh, for, so that they can apply for the job and have equal opportunity to uh, be hired by the company. We will talk about inquir inquiries that you may and may not make regarding medical history and limitations. So we've got some do's and don'ts there. Uh, we want to be very mindful with applicants as well as current employees that we aren't overstepping uh, their medical privacy and that we aren't getting um, more information than we need to make a decision on either hiring or on accommodating the employee which brings to the other thing that we are going to talk about today, which is the reasonable accommodation uh, requirement and the process. It is not easy um, to understand. It's not necessarily intuitive, but we will walk through this process, this uh, expectation that you provide reasonable accommodations to employees and also to applicants as well, again, with regard to their ability to apply for the job. And we'll talk about the interactive process, which is kind of the key, uh, the key framework, um, I don't know, better way to say it than the key framework that we apply when we are trying to meet our obligations under the reasonable um, accommodation requirement for employers. And we're going to talk about scenarios. And I specifically have a scenario that I really liked and was really happy to come up with regarding Homer Simpson. So I'm just putting that out there that, that there's going to be some Homer Simpson um, scenarios. And if, so if you like The Simpsons, uh, like I do, and have been watching them for like, I don't know, like 25 years or whatever, Simpsons has been around, it seems like, a, I think it's been around at all, around that length of time. Um, hopefully you'll appreciate this, I'm sorry. Um, hopefully you'll appreciate my examples, I guess. Um, and also, I hope that my audio is, is good on this. Um, the, we have been having, I'm just going to blame it on coronavirus. We have been, I, and probably the uh, VPN network, but for whatever reason, the audio seems to have not, like sometimes it's not, it's not working. I was having the same problem with Verizon yesterday, losing, losing calls. So I don't, I don't think it has to do with our system necessarily. I think it's just like an overall communication system here in uh, Minneapolis. Okay. So what is the ADA? Uh, so again, apologies if uh, if I break up here and here and there. Um, so what is the ADA? So it's it is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's been around a long time, 
And uh, I think off the top of my head, I think it was passed in 1991. Don't quote me on that, but it's been around a long time. I think it was the first President Bush that signed it into law. And what here is what it does. Um, it prohibits discrimination, okay? I don't think that's going to surprise surprise anybody. But who does it prohibit discrimination against? We talk about protected classes. So the ADA prohibits discrimination against the protected class, somebody who is a qualified applicant or a qualified employee because of their disability or because of their perceived disability. And there's a lot in that definition, um, right? So the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against qualified applicants and qualified employees because of their disability or perceived disability. That is not to say that just because somebody is disabled, you can't fire them. That is not to say that you have to hire every disabled person that comes in the door. This is to say that you cannot hold that against them, that that cannot be, that cannot be part of the decision tree or decision framework that you employ when, when you make your decision on hiring or if you make your decision on terminating or suspending or disciplining. It all, but again, it does not give a free pass to people just because of their disabilities, um, whether it's known or unknown. And also perceived disability. So if you think somebody's disabled, there's a lot of people out there that think they're doctors. They're not. A lot of people think they've, they've got some great medical expertise and they can, they can suss out who's, a, who's a, a disabled person and who's not a disabled person. Unless you are a doctor, like a medical doctor. If you're on the call right now and you're a medical doctor, don't listen to this because it doesn't apply to you. But if you are not, if you are not a medical doctor, don't pretend to be one and don't play one. Employers, managers, supervisors who don't have a medical background pretending that they know about what, that they know what a disabled person is and isn't, it is a recipe for a legal disaster. Best not to assume best not to pretend that you know stuff. I have an, I have, uh, an uncle, and I remember when I was a kid, um, so I've never told this story, but um, when I was a kid, he told a story about my father, and my father had a, his appendix burst and all that. And my uncle, who, when I figured it out, was like 18 at the time my father's appendix burst, um, my uncle was telling me the story, and I was about 13 when I, I was hearing this story. And he was telling the story how he was consulting with the doctor and he was telling him all about the appendix bursting and he was like there in the surgery and, and everything. And I said, you know, oh, are you like, I literally thought my uncle was a doctor. No, he, he climbed a uh, telephone poles for AT&T, right? In his mind, he had some medical expertise. He knew all about the whole appendix thing. Um, you know, he was a blowhard. He didn't know anything, um, but he told a story as though he was a doctor. I literally thought he was a doctor and even asked him, and he said, I'm kind of a do like a doctor. But actually, in reality, he climbed telephone poles for AT&T back in the day. Um, so anyway, don't pretend to be a doctor. We cannot discriminate. We can't um, affect the terms or conditions of somebody's employment because of, because of either their actual disability or a perceived disability. And we'll talk about what a disability is and what it, and what it is in, uh, in a second. So what else does the ADA require? The ADA requires that employers do all of these things, provide a reasonable accommodation to employers, employees with a known disability. If you have no idea that the person has a disability, you don't need to provide a reasonable accommodation. But if you know the person has a disability and that disability is impacting their ability to do the job or they, they have a known disability when they're an applicant and you're like, well, I don't think, you know, you're missing an arm and this job requires, let's just use my uncle. I guess we're going to use my uncle as an example today. This job requires that you climb telephone poles and you need two arms likely to climb telephone poles you know, you still want to go through the reasonable accommodation process, but could you eventually not, after going through that process and going through that conversation, could you eventually not hire my uncle if he's missing an arm to climb telephone poles? Absolutely. Um, but, it, but do you have to provide a reasonable accommodation? Uh, and, and maybe my uncle says, well, could you buy me a prosthetic arm? With a prosthetic arm, I could get it. Well, that'd be unreasonable, and the law doesn't require you to do it. 
but you have to provide a reasonable accommodation. Again, we're going to get into what a reasonable accommodation is, what reasonableness is uh, in this presentation. But can you provide a reasonable accom if you can provide a reasonable accommodation to the employee and you know that the employee has a disability, then you're required under law to do it. If the if the reasonable accommodation uh, if performing the duties would be an undue hardship on you, however, you don't have to provide a reasonable accommodation, right? So it, let's just take the prosthet the um, the prosthetic. If you're a small company and you're hiring my uncle to climb telephone poles and he is missing an arm and, you know, he says, well, yeah, I could be accommodated if you bought some sort of harness uh, thing that would cost, but, it, but good news, it only costs like a million dollars, right? And you're a smaller company. You don't have a million dollars. Maybe if you're Amazon, a million dollars is no big deal. Like you might have just made that in like a second or five seconds of, you know, business operations. But with, um, with, climbing, with climbing telephone poles, if you're a small, smaller employer, a million dollars, well, that's just absolutely unreasonable. Like you, you cannot buy, you can't spend a million dollars. Could you maybe spend $500? Well, yeah, it's probably fairly reasonable for you to spend $500 to help my uncle climb the telephone poles. But but a million dollars? No. If the harness costs a million dollars, very if if it's if it's going to cause an undue hardship because that million dollars on the business, um, then absolutely you don't have to you don't have to provide the accommodation. But if it is reasonable, you have to do it. If it's going to cause an undue hardship to the to the business, and you get to decide what that undue hardship is, but you got to be reasonable and you can't make up stuff on it, then you can say, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to reasonably accommodate you because it would be an undue hardship to the business. If it would pose a direct threat of harm to the employee or coworkers, you don't need to reasonably accommodate a person. So, for example, in uh, in my in my situation, if the if my uncle says, "Look, I, you know, you can get the harness. It's not, but then you do some studies and you look into the harness situation, and the harness isn't foolproof, right?" 95% of the time it works, 5% of the time the person falls down the, the, you know, it doesn't work, it like disengages. Okay, well, that's a direct threat of harm to my uncle with the one arm that, you know, the situation that I've completely made up here on the fly. So 5% of the time, I guess I don't like those odds, that 5% of the time he might fall off of his telephone pole right? Because the harness doesn't work 100% of the time. That's a direct threat of harm to himself. He also might knock somebody over uh, as he falls. That's also a direct threat to his coworkers. We can, at that point, if we've assessed that there's a direct threat to the employee or to coworkers because of the disability and we can't, and we can't accommodate around that, then you don't have to then you don't have to accommodate the person but again you have to do an individualized assessment to see if it's a direct threat you just can't say like no 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 we're not going to buy any harness at all sorry we just don't you know we're not going to spend we're not going to spend $500 on harnesses just we don't do that sort of thing well that's you don't get to do that you need to assess the direct threat in that situation that $500 harness 500 bucks probably fairly reasonable um, to do. You've assessed that it's a reasonable thing to buy, but then you have to assess the accommodation itself. Is that harness going to, going to potentially, use of that harness potentially pose a direct threat? Well, yeah, it is. If 5% if of the time it, it like breaks and, and puts him in harm, that's a direct threat to harm. We, can, we, can, um, we don't have to then get him the harness because we've made this assessment on the harness and on the situation. Now, if use of the harness is not going to put anybody in direct threat, but there's another situation, like maybe the person's using a harness to not climb telephone poles, but just to like stay on the ground and do something else. Well, you know, or maybe it's a chair. Maybe my uncle, maybe my uncle needs a special chair because of whatever disability he has. And he needs a, a special chair, and this chair is $500, and that's reasonable to buy. And there's no threat that the chair is going to pose to him. Well, then you would, you would be expected to do it. So we have to do an individual assessment to, make, to see what the accommodation is, to see how the person can accommodate, be accommodated, and then what the you know, potential downside risks are to the accommodation. You are also, as an employer, 
um, required that you're prohibited from retaliating against employees who request accommodations. So if somebody re if somebody asks, hey, I need a harness, I need some sort of accommodation, and by the way, they don't have to use those words. Like they don't have to use the word, I, you know, dear supervisor, I need an accommodation because I have cancer. Uh, here is how it's impacting my my job. I am unable to do. Uh, essential duties one, two, and three. They don't need to do that. The only people that do that are like, you know, lawyers like myself that uh, know all the elements. Like that's not what typical people need to say. Suffice it to say, if somebody asks for an accommodation, uh, if somebody is disabled, you are un you cannot, uh, you can't retaliate against them for talking, for asking for help, for asking for an accommodation. Uh, we can't we can't hold it against them. We also can't discriminate or or retaliate against employees because of their their actual disability or their perceived disability. So if I if I just have it against people with epilepsy because you know I just have a thing against epileptics, I can't go in. I, I can't refuse to hire them because of that. Even if somebody doesn't actually have epilepsy. Uh, but I think they do. Like I'm sitting there during the interview and I'm chewing on my pen and I'm looking at them and I'm like, you are, yeah, you're one of those epileptics. Oh, I hate those epileptics. And I don't want to hire you. And then that person, like the interviewee is like not epileptic at all, but just, you know, whatever, I, for whatever reason I thought they were. Um, okay. They, you know, I can't, I can't hold that against them. That's a perceived disability. They're still protected. It's weird, right? But, it, but they're still protected because I can't, I can't have the, the unlawful intent. I cannot have this unlawful intent um, to discriminate or retaliate against somebody, whether they're actually disabled or not. It's weird, but that's how it works. What does the ADA apply to? Okay, it's going to apply to your business. Uh, it's going to apply to Harris um, because Harris has more than 15 employees. So it's, it's going to apply to you. Um, there are small employers out there that it doesn't apply to, but it's going to apply to you. I put this in there only to round out your ADA 101 knowledge so that you are an absolute expert um, after this 90 minutes. Who does the ADA protect? It protects, again, we've kind of already talked about this, but it protects employees and applicants, right? Current employees as well as applicants. They have to be, quote, disabled. We'll talk about what that means to be disabled. They need to be qualified for the position held or sought. We'll talk about that. But in short, they've got to be able to do the job. So to be able to do the, to be qualified, you have to be qualified with or without a reasonable accommodation. If my uncle can't climb, can't climb telephone poles, and it's essential that you know to go up to the old telephone, uh, like the um, Oscar the Grouch type of, I know Oscar the Grouch was not. There was another Sesame Street character with that was in like a telephone thing. Anyway, Oscar the Grouch was in a garbage can. Um, so my uncle's got to climb up the telephone poles. It's essential for his job. He is not qualified unless he gets an accommodation. But if we can't accommodate him, he's missing an arm, he can't climb without a harness. And if we determine that we can't reasonably accommodate him, uh, because like the harness situation doesn't work, and obviously a prosthetic would be something we don't have to do, but we just can't, there, we can't get a harness that's, that's 100%, um, that doesn't put him in direct threat of, of harm, then he's not qualified. We don't have to hire him. We literally can not hire him, or we can fire him if he's currently in the job. But we literally cannot hire him because because he's he can't do the job. And it's not it is you know indirectly because he's disabled, but but more importantly, it's because his disability prohibits him from being able to do the job. And uh, there are a lot of climbing jobs out there. You know, for example, epileptics. I mean, if you've got seizures and you're climbing a, a tower or, you know, a telephone pole, okay, I think that, you know, how are you going to, you would, you would have a conversation with them, say, hey, how can we, you know, you're an epileptic, you've got seizures. Um, what does that look like? Can you, 
can you um, mitigate it? Do you see them coming? If the answer is no, yeah, I see them coming, but I only have like five minutes notice or 30 seconds notice and you're up on a tower and it takes like, you know, 15 minutes to get down that tower. Okay. Like you might realize, like there's no way to accommodate that person. You might find that you just can't hire them because they're a direct threat to themselves because they're epileptics and they, and they might have a seizure when they're like 50 feet up in the air. And so they're, they're not qualified for the position. They might be qualified to do other positions in the company, but they're applying for your position. They might, they're not qualified for that position. If you've had this conversation, you've tried to think about accommodations for them and it doesn't work. So it protects people who are disabled under the law as the law defines disabled, it protects people and those people who are disabled, they have to be qualified for the, posi the position that they're seeking and or that they're currently in. And they have to be able to perform the essential functions of that position with or without a reasonable accommodation. If they don't need an accommodation, then no big deal. You can be as disabled as you want. If they can perform the duties of the job then you don't need to accommodate them. I'll give you an example. Uh, employee comes up to you and says, hey, I've got, I've got depression. Uh, or an applicant tells you, hey, I've got depression, right? You don't want to ask about that in an interview, but, and you don't even ask of that of an employee. But if the employee comes up to you and they say, hey, just, just you know, I've always wondered, but I've, I've got depression. Um, and then you look at them and you say, okay, does this impact your ability? Let's just go with my uncle, my climbing towers again. You have to climb towers as that's essential for your job and you need to like fix the telephone wires and everything. Does your depression in any way prevent you from climbing towers and, and working on the telephone uh, wires? No. And the person might say, no, it doesn't. No, I don't think it's going to impact me. Um, then, okay, thanks for telling me. I appreciate that. Let me know if this changes, but send them on their merry way. You don't have to accommodate them if their disability doesn't impact their ability to do the essential functions of the job. Uh, a lot of people have dis disabilities. I think technically, I don't know, I think they did some studies. It's like, you know, around 30% or so of Americans technically have disabilities under this law, have, have a, a, one or more disabilities under this law. Um, it doesn't mean that they're impacting their job. You can, have, you, can, you can have cancer. Maybe cancer impacts my, uh, if my uncle has cancer, maybe it impacts his ability to climb towers. Maybe it doesn't. If the cancer does impact it, then we have to talk about reasonable accommodations with them. But if the cancer doesn't impact his ability to climb towers and work on telephone wires, and we would ask this of him when he brings it to us, like, hey, I've got cancer. Okay, does it impact your ability to climb towers and work on, and work on telephone wires? Those are the two essential duties for this job. No. Okay, uh, move on. Go back to your job. If it does, then engage in the conversation. We'll talk about what that looks like. But at that point, so we don't, just because somebody's disabled doesn't mean that we can definitely help them. That's the point. But we do have to make individualized assessments. Okay. We've been talking around, uh, 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 around the definition of what a disability is. Here is what it is. It is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of life's major activities of the person physical or mental impairment substantially limits one or more of life's major activities. We'll talk about what, what life's major activities are. This is to say it's not just every little physical or mental malady that you have. If you've got a headache that day, or, and it's not because of a, like a long-term condition, but it's just like, hey, I have a one-off headache. Um, I was out drinking last night. I've got a hangover. I'm not really up to, you know, being a lawyer today, right? Said like no lawyer ever. Um, that's not a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits, right? Now it might, it might limit for that day. It might limit my ability to like, uh, you know, walk or talk or think or something like that because I've got a headache, but it's not, 
it's not substantially limi- limiting um, limiting me, okay? So it's got to be a physical or a mental impairment substantially limiting or a record of having such impairment. That gets a little complicated. I don't want to dive too much into that. But if somebody's been telling you like for a long, long time, like they've got headaches, they've got headaches, they've got headaches, and and it's like, yeah, I've got migraines, I've got migraines, I've got migraines, and they have a record of this, well, it puts you on knowledge, so they, they have a disability. Uh, or being regarded as having an impairment. So again, my epileptic uh, thing where I, um, where I like, uh, you know, maybe there's somebody in the office here and they, I don't know, they go off every once in a while and disappear for like 15 minutes. I think they're going off to have se- to deal with seizures, but actually they're going off to have smoke breaks secretly. But I think they're going off to have seizures and I, you know, I can't go and f- I, I wouldn't want to go and fire them because they're going and taking what I think are seizure breaks. Um, when they're actually taking, right. Now I could fire them for taking smoke breaks if it's against my policy, but I feel like sneak out and do that. But I, I can't fire them because I think they're, um, they're an epileptic going and having seizures. What here are the things that qualify for one or more of life's major activities, any one of these, if your employee, and this is why you can see these things, and you're like, oh, okay, now I understand why, like, Congress thinks about a third of Americans or so have qualified for having a disability under this law. So here they are, caring for oneself, seeing, hearing, eating. If you, any of these things are impacted because of a physical or a mental malady, impairment, you're going to be qualified, you're going to be considered disabled, Right. Working is always my favorite one. Um, but if you, if you have a hard time doing any of these things, if you're limited, if your capacity is limited in any one of these things, then you're going to be disabled. And again, who makes this determination? The answer is not non-medical providers, not us. Medical providers uh, make these determinations. That's why when somebody comes to you and they say, Hey, you know what? I've just, uh, I've got the blues and it's really impacting my ability to stay awake during work. Right. And so I keep falling asleep at my desk. Um, it's just been happening and it's because maybe it's just like the seasonal thing. Maybe it's because I've started smoking a bunch of marijuana due to, you know, legalization laws. I don't know. But I'm falling asleep at my desk. I'm having a hard time getting into work on time. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm probably depressed. That's why, you know, we're not armchair uh, doctors. That's why you then send the person to, a, to get a medical opinion on this, right, so that we can find out, like, okay, what is the actual malady? If it's just because the person's smoking a bunch of marijuana, then that's not a physical or a mental impairment, right? If it's because they're depressed – then that is then that's going to be a mental impairment that's affecting sleeping and uh, that's impacting the job. So you would want to get a medical opinion on that to find out how you know if there's any way that you can accommodate that person so that they can perform the essential functions and duties of the job. Okay, first Simpsons uh, example. Bored at work one day, Homer finds a manual about being disabled. So score. Shortly thereafter, and by the way, if any of you have seen the Simpsons episode, like score points for you, it's, uh, it's like one of the better um, HR Simpsons episodes that there is. Okay. Board at work one day, Homer finds a manual about being disabled. Shortly thereafter, he gains uh, 250 pounds, develops diabetes, has knee, uh, knees replaced, and can no longer walk up the stairs to his desk at the nuclear power plant. Homer made himself disabled, right? Um, that's no, not normally how disabilities work, but we're just, again, this is a cartoon. This is an example. We're just going to go with it for fun. Um, but he's got diabetes now. He's had knees replaced. Again, go back to that list. Um, bending, walking, diabetes is a, is, you know, has, uh, ramif- you know, maladies attached to it as well, just, you know, like some of these things. Can no longer walk up the stairs. His employer is at a loss. So Mr. Burns is at a loss. 
Homer was relatively healthy, but what, then in a year it deteriorated significantly. Is Homer disabled? Take out the fact that he, you know, willingly gained his 250 pounds. Just let's say he accidentally gained the 250 pounds. The key is the, the diabetes, right? The key is the, knee, the knees replaced. And the answer is, the answer is yes. He is, he is likely to be disabled. So we don't know. And why don't we know? Because we are not medical providers. So we, we should not act like doctors. In this sort of situation, we've got some inkling that, hey, Homer can't walk up, uh, walk up the stairs. To, he's got it. It's essential. So in, in, at Homer's, um, at the nuclear power plant, Homer's desk is like, I think he's like the quality safety officer, right? So his desk there's a button on his desk, and it is to like deactivate or depower the nuclear, um, the nuclear plant, power plant. So, if it's going to you know go nuclear, blow or whatever, he needs to push a button, and and he needs to uh, chill it out or you know deactivate it or whatever you know make it better. Well that his desk is up there the buttons up there he's got to it's he's got to walk up there right he's got to walk up there to get to it so it's impacting his ability to do his job his essential job is literally to sit there and push the button when when called upon so is he disabled probably but we don't know for sure so what would you do you would send you would say hey i've got a form for you to fill out take this to your medical provider have your medical provider fill this out and um and and see if uh if um you know see if if the based on what the medical provider says that you have like a long lasting you know that you're substantially limited in one or more of these life's major activities it sounds like he might be being being obese is not in and of itself um, a disability, so that's the courts are pretty clear on that. So just being really, really uh, overweight, uh, morbidly obese, even um, is not a disability in and of itself. But the ramifications, the the result of being obese, like diabetes and knees replaced and that sort of thing, uh, that could uh, make somebody disabled and probably does make Homer disabled in this situation. So again, send him to the doctor get some medical information. We don't want to just make assumptions. We want to find out if he is disabled because if he is disabled, then it's going to, then it's going to trigger our next steps, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit here. So what action, what action does the uh, ADA, you know, so who, you know, what are situations where the ADA applies? So it applies to job application process procedures, right? So if you have an applicant and the applicant, let's just say, let's just go back to Homer. Homer is really, really weight. He gained 250 pounds, so let's just put him at about 400 pounds, uh, has diabetes, can't go up the stairs, had knees replaced. Um, and your job application, you know, the interview is on the third floor and you don't have an elevator. Okay. Um, Homer asks if you can move the interview down to the first floor because Homer can't walk up two flights of stairs. And, and if Homer is disabled, you're supposed to do that. So, right, and just say, oh, okay, you, oh, I'm sorry, you, um, you need an accommodation, you need to, and Homer's like, yeah, I can't, I'm like my knees are, have been replaced, I can't walk up the stairs. Okay, it would then trigger an affirmative obligation by you as the employer to then move the interview down to like the first floor or somewhere accessible for Homer so that he can apply for the job and have the interview just like everybody else. It applies to hiring. It, as I said, it applies to advancement. It applies to discharge of employees. Um, so, for any any sort of any sort of terms or conditions of employment. So, again, if um, if Homer's up for a promotion or if he's just performing his job, we need to we have an affirmative obligation to try to explore reasonable accommodations with Homer, even if he's in his current job, like he is with the nuclear power plant, uh, we have affirmative obligations to try to work with him so that we can accommodate him. And if we can't do that, then, um, then in that situation, then we might, you know, discharge or fire him if we ultimately can't accommodate him and um, the, uh, uh, you know, he can't perform the essential functions of his job. 
it also applies to employee compensation. We cannot hold it against Homer or anybody or my uncle or whatever. We can't hold their disability or any accommodations that we're making against uh, for them. We can't hold it against them uh, for compensation. So we can't, you know, pay them less or fire them um, or, you know, do anything negative along along those lines. Training. We need to uh, again. All the terms and conditions of employment need to be need to be um, need to be adhered to for Homer. So he gets trained as well, and we can't hold it against him. So just you know, like let's just say the training. There's there's job training, and the training's up on the third floor. And you've been accommodating Homer by letting him, you know, by moving his desk down to the first floor because he can't walk up the flight of stairs to his desk at the at the nuclear power plant. Well, if the training is on the third floor, if there is a way to accommodate Homer and move that training to the first floor, you you are required to as the employer to do it. If it's impossible, if it's unreason, I shouldn't say impossible. If it's unreasonable for you to move the training down to the first floor. Uh, to accommodate Homer, then you don't have to do it. But if it is possible, if it's, I'm sorry, if it's reasonable, you're supposed to, exp- you're expected to accommodate Homer by moving the training down to the, down to the first floor. Um, if there are other terms and conditions, privileges of employment, um, other things, you know, I, we could go on and on about, about uh, other situations, but um, if there's anything else related to the employment, it is your, it is your affirmative obligation as the employer to uh, try to uh, reasonably accommodate your disabled employees. You might not be able to to accommodate them. I mean, that's just so. I'll give you an example of where you might not be able to accommodate them. I mean, you might not be able to accommodate Homer on the training. What if you've got you uh, your office and, and Homer works? We'll just use Homer. Homer works in the office, or he works at the nuclear power plant. And the nuclear power plant has uh, mold in it. You know, trace amounts of mold. It's within OSHA standards, but there's trace amounts of mold at the nuclear power plant where Homer's job is. And he's got to be there. He's got to push that button. He's got to see if there's nuclear meltdown about to happen. It's essential for his job. He's got to work there. Well, but Homer has a disability, whatever he's got, I don't know, um, again, not a doctor, maybe like emphysema or something. Anyway, he's got some sort of respiratory thing going on that that uh, the mold, he is especially sensitive to mold, and it makes it really, really difficult for him to breathe. And he, so he cannot work at the nuclear power plant because of the mold. And you can't get rid of the mold. Like you're within OSHA guidelines and you just can't get rid of the mold. There's nothing you can do about it. So, you know, Homer's just going to have to suck it up, basically. So you could try things with him, right? So Homer comes to you and he's like, hey, you know, I've got this uh, condition and it was just diagnosed and here's my medical documentation and I, I just can't work around this amount of mold. Well, you could try to, you know, engage with a conversation with Homer and just say, you know, hey, can we do like air filters? Is there a mask you can wear? Uh, can we get some like fans blowing all over you? I mean, is there anything we can do to to accommodate you? You can't, you know, just build a, do a whole new building like that's unreasonable, right? That's like a definite undue hardship. So you would try to accommodate him um, so that he can do his job, so that he can get paid and all that. And if um, if you ultimately, you know, can't accommodate him. Well, then, you know, he's not qualified for the job. He can't, and um, and you could just like move on from from there. But that's we'll talk about that in a little bit about the reasonable accommodation process. Examples of disability discrimination in the workplace. Here are ways that we dis- that we can discriminate against employees. I again, I don't recommend doing any of these things, but yeah, this I'm is just... what we want to be on the on the watch for. Okay, so examples of disability in the in the workplace: seating, segregating, classifying em, employees, uh, candidates on the basis of disability, denying equal jobs or benefits uh, to qualified individuals, 
because of his or her relationship. Um, so denying, you know, job limiting, segregating, all these sorts of things using discriminatory test standards or selection criteria. So there's a lot of ways that we can discriminate against people. Again, this isn't like, uh, you know, take notes on ways that we can discriminate against against people. Um, but uh, that's, you know, that's a um, that's an example of, you know, a bunch of uh, ways to do that we discriminate. So we want to watch out to make sure that we're not that we're not doing that. Okay, examples of disability discrimination. Again, more more things. One of the things, especially with the COVID nineteen uh, that we're that we're dealing with, is um, you know the question of medical examinations. So, for example, with COVID nineteen, uh, you know you're generally not supposed to do a medical examination. Again, you're an employer. You're not a doctor. Um, and uh, so medical examinations are are not allowed. You're not supposed to do inquiries. Uh, one of the things with COVID-19, a lot of employers have been wanting to uh, do um, testing of temperature to see if the person's running a fever. And the answer to that is that you can't. So the, AD, the EEOC came out and said, hey, yeah, just to be clear, yeah, go ahead and do a, you know, you, if you want to, you can do you can do temperature temperature testing um, for this. It's not going to be a medical a medical examination. So, um, you know, you can do you can check an employee's temperature. But beyond that, like you know, medical inquiries, we really shouldn't be shouldn't be getting too deeply into it. That's protected information. We also can't discriminate against them based on. Um, their application for benefits and their entitlement to benefits. So we can't just say, hey, oh, sorry, you've got, you've got a disability. You need to, um, you know, I don't really want you on our, my group medical plan. So if you could, like, not go on to our group medical plan and uh, run up our medical benefits, I'd really, really appreciate it. That'd be great. We also, it's also a, a form of discrimination prohibited by, under the ADA to failure, fail to reasonably uh, accommodate the known physical or mental um, limitations. So if somebody tells you like they've got cancer, they've got one arm or they've got emphysema or seizures or whatever it is, um, and, you, and you're going to like f fire them or you know, not give them the same opportunities or counsel them or suspend them or cut their wages or whatever um, the uh, uh, because of you know you actually have an affirmative obligation to reasonably accommodate uh, them so you can't just like refuse to do it um, you actually are supposed to do it okay so what does it mean to have knowledge so we're gonna you know we've talked about what it is to be to be disabled it's one or more uh, you know, um, physical or mental impairments that limits one or more of life's major activities. So what is it now to have knowledge? So, you know, I don't have to read minds. I am not good at it. And so as an employer, as a supervisor, HR person, I don't need to read minds. I need, but I need to have knowledge. Knowledge can come from the circumstances. It could I, obviously come from the person come, coming up to you and saying, hey, I've got, by the way, I have, I am depressed and I need um, some accommodations. Here's how the depression is impacting me, right? So that's, that's uh, knowledge. Like you have knowledge when the person tells you that they have a disability. Doesn't mean that you can't, uh, that you still, that you can't um, confirm that knowledge and that you, um, you know, can't ask for medical, in, you know, input, but, but um, the knowledge itself can come from the circumstances. So uh, it can come from circumstances. It can come directly from the employee or a coworker. It does not have to be in writing. It doesn't. It, it has to be in plain language. Um, so you don't. You don't have to read in between the lines and everything. But they don't have to say, "Hey, I have a disability. I need an accommodation." Right? If they are sitting there struggling during the application, you know, to get up the stairs to like Homer struggling to walk up the stairs to the interview. And he's, you know, just can't do it because of his knees, and is pretty evident to you. And he doesn't say, um, "Hey, could you, could we move the interview down to the first floor?" He doesn't need to say that. You need to think at that point. Hey, is there any way that I could accommodate you? I can see that you're not able to make it up these stairs. 
Homer, um, because you're struggling, you can't like make it up the first stair. And Homer says, yeah, if, if we could do the interview on the first floor, that'd be, that'd be great. There it is. That's the, you've got knowledge. You saw it. You de- derived it from the circumstances. Um, you didn't have to read minds. You saw it. And, you know, but if somebody has, like, somebody might have depression, somebody might have cancer, especially the mental impairments, like, we don't, we don't know. We don't, um, we don't necessarily know what those are. We can't tell, right? Like, somebody has depression, somebody might have insomnia, might, somebody might have cancer. Like, we, a lot of times, we just can't see it. Like, we have no idea. And so we wouldn't know to ask, and we don't have to. If we, if we don't know from the circumstances or from the person telling us, then we don't have to just assume. I mean, we can't be, we can't be held accountable at that point for not accommodating um, in, that, in that type of situation when we don't have actual knowledge. Okay, so while you are working with Emily, she mentions that she was recently diagnosed with cancer. Sorry about Emily. She doesn't mention anything about needing time off work. She doesn't mention that is impacting her ability to do her job. What do you do? Uh, You know, like a human, say that you're sorry. And that's about it. Like mainly, mainly you just need to confirm with Emily that it's not impact, that the cancer isn't impacting her ability to do the essential functions of her job. If she's still totally fine doing her job, it's not hurting her performance, it's not hurting her ability to come in. At this point, she doesn't need any time off work to deal with the cancer. Yeah, she's disabled, but so what? I mean, I, you know, obviously, you know, we feel bad for her, but from an HR perspective, so what? Um, she's got a disability. Okay, she's still doing her job. Great. We don't have to do anything. We can ask her. What we would want to do is say, hey, Emily, if things change for you, so you can do your job, no problem, you're not having any problems? She says yes. You just say, okay, hey, Emily, if, um, if you could just let me know, like, let me know if that changes. Like, if, you're having, if you need some time off or if you're struggling uh, to do your job because of your cancer, you, you let me know. Now, you don't have to excuse. Ex- you know, Emily doesn't get an excuse for being a bad performer just because she's got cancer. So now, now, you know, if she was like a mediocre performer and you were counseling her and now she has cancer and she's still a mediocre performer, you, you know, you can still counsel her. You can still discipline her for it. You might even eventually fire her for it if the cancer's not impacting her, but she's just a crappy performer with or without cancer. You can, you know, you can take her down a typical disciplinary counseling, counseling type of path. But if, she, if the cancer is impacting her ability to do her job, then we, need to, then we need to accommodate. Again, we put it out there for her. We let her come to us to tell her that the cancer is impacting uh, her job, you know, now or later down, later down the line. Okay, so what is knowledge? Again, oh, this, I don't know why this got doubled. Sometimes that happens when it gets loaded. Okay, so what does it mean to be, to be qualified? So to be qualified, uh, the person has to be a person with or without um, a qualified individual. So the person with or without a reasonable accommodation, so you know, Homer, my uncle, all that sort of thing, can perform the essential functions of the job. If you're Emily and you've got cancer, you're disabled, but you're still able to do your job, you're qualified, right? My uncle, no arm, he, we can't find, you know, we've, we've tried to accommodate him with a, a harness, but there's no harness on the market that is 100% um, safe for him. He can't climb telephone towers, and the telephone towers, doing that is essential for, for, for that job, for his for his job, um, he's not qualified. He cannot perform the essential function of the job because there's no accommodation for him, okay? Emily can, Emily doesn't even need an accommodation. If my uncle, if you've got Homer, and Homer has his uh, you know, desk job, and they're able to move the desk downstairs, 
um, and forget the mold thing, but Homer just need, you know, the molds out of the, we figure out the mold thing, but he just, he can't, he's got the diabetes and, and the replaced knees and he can't go up the stairs. Then in that situation, um, Homer, uh, you know, we can accommodate Homer and he is qualified. So if he can, you know, just do it on the first floor, he's qualified. So he is going to be a qualified individual. They, the person along these lines has to satisfy all the skills, experience, education, degree, other legitimate requirements. If, um, if for Homer's job, he's disabled and they're able to move the, the um, desk down onto the first floor, that's great. But if he needs to have a Ph.D. in nuclear physics, physics, uh, physics and Homer doesn't have that degree, then or or the experience like it says five years of experience pushing buttons at a nuclear power plant and homer only has three well you don't have to give him a pass just because he's disabled right it's not this isn't like an affirmative action type of program like law you don't need to you don't need to give give homer preferential treatment if he needs if he needs to have a phd in physics in nuclear physics and he has only a master's degree in nuclear physics, you don't have to give him a pass and, and hire him. He's not qualified. He doesn't meet the other qualifications, the skills, the experience, all of the legitimate qualifications for the job, not just the physical qualifications. Direct threat. I want to make sure that we understand uh, direct threat. So direct threat, and I talked about it earlier, if the employee, if the employee's disability, uh, accommodating them or their disability itself, creates a direct threat to themselves or others, then there, then you can, then you don't have to hire them, or you, or you can, you could um, fire them. I, you know, hate to use the word fire, but you could, you know, see if there's another job available, if there's, if there's some openings, and if there's not, you know, they could be fired, but. That's what direct threat means. Um, direct threat has to be, it, it's their, their disability creates a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of themselves or others that cannot be limited or reduced by a reasonable accommodation. Again, my uncle's situation, he's got one, one arm. He climbs telephone poles. He's going to be 50 feet up in the air. He, and, and the accommodation, it can't mitigate that risk. Even with the accommodation, he cannot, it can't mitigate the risk. He could fall and hurt himself. He could hurt others. That's a direct threat. But again, we need to do individual analysis to say, hey, can we get a harness? Is there a harness on the market? Is it cheap enough? Is it reasonable enough? We can't just say, poo-poo, hey, you've got one arm. There's no way you can do this job. That doesn't work. That's, not, that's going to violate the ADA. If the employee... If the employee comes to us and they say, hey, yeah, I've got, you know, one arm and I know it, uh, climb, climb tower, I'm strong enough to do it, but I'm going to need a harness to do it. I've done that at other employers. Like, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at the situation. Seizures. You might not be able to accommodate around seizures at all. And if my uncle's climbing, let's say my uncle has seizures and he's climbing, climbing towers, it, by definition, makes him, um, it might make him um, a direct threat to himself and others. If he has a seizure up there and, and he doesn't have enough forewarning on the seizures because that's just the, you know, he's got epilepsy and that's just how it works. Well, then in that situation, then you can't, you can't stop it. Um, and there's no, and if there's, and you talk to him about it and say, hey, do you know, is there any way to, for you to see this? Is there any medication you can take? Or if you have these, is this, you know, what's, what's it going to look like? And you have this conversation with him to make sure that you understand what, 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 the, um, what the situation is, what happens with the seizures, and what the risk is. And then if it does pose a direct threat risk, then you can say, hey, I, you know, we just can't give you that job. Uh, or, hey, you're not, you know, now you've developed seizures in this job. I can't have you still climbing, climbing the telephone poles. It just puts you at risk, and it puts others at risk, and there's no way for us to mitigate that, to, get, to take that risk away. Again, <clears throat> individual determination, what to consider. These are the elements that you're going to consider when you're making this individual, you're having this conversation with my uncle or anybody else. Um, and again, we want to make, we don't want to, um, we want to make it based on evidence. It's got to be based on objective evidence and not, you know, opinions and fears and stereotypes. And again, we are not doctors. 
So if my uncle comes and says, no, no, I've used harnesses at other employers, it's really not a problem. Well, okay, let's, maybe we have to just try it out and, and see, and maybe we do some research and we, and we get an opinion on the, the harness and what the risk is. And we find out. And if we find out that, hey, yeah, there's ways to mitigate the risk and, and these harnesses should work 100% of the time, like, okay, then, then try it out. And if you find out after like a, a week or a month or, or whatever that, um, you know, maybe my uncle does fall and, and hurts himself and we find out that the harnesses don't work and he does pose a direct threat, okay, then, you, you know, you've hired him. It didn't work out. Um, and, then, and then you, you, uh, you know, can let him go assuming there's no other way to, to accommodate him, but you should at least try. So things to consider, like the duration of the risk, what the, the um, actual potential risk is, is it major or minor? Obviously falling off of a 50 foot tower is going to be a major, major risk. What is the, uh, versus a minor risk of like, you know, maybe like uh, a cut or something like that, if he's not really falling at all. Um, What's the likelihood, the potential harm that would occur? We want to consider that. And then we want, to, we want to figure out the imminence of the potential harm. The key for you is that you go through this thought process. And you might come to the conclusion that you just cannot accommodate my uncle climbing those towers. That's fine. But you, you need to consider, go through this, this decision tree and consider, indivi- um, consider all of this for, um, for my uncle individually. Okay, what is a reasonable accommodation? So reasonable accommodation is a modification. We've talked about it uh, around it, right? It's a modification or adjustment for an applicant or the employee for the position uh, to apply for the position or an employee for the position to perform the essential functions uh, or, and or enjoy the equal benefits and privileges of, em- of employment. So it is basically a modification that we make so they can so they, they can perform the essential functions. Now for applicants, it's a modification to the interview or the application process. We've talked about that. For an employee, it's a modification to their to their job. If you have an employee and the employee hurts themselves, say they get a work comp injury, but it's going to be long lasting, and they are in a position that you know that that position uh, requires that that they lift 25 or more pounds regularly. And based on their back injury now, they can only lift up to 10 pounds. And they can, you know, they're not, they're restricted from lifting 25 or more pounds. So, you know, you would get, you would go down this framework um, thought process to see if you can reasonably accommodate them, if you can make an adjustment to an essential function of the job. If the lifting part of the job is non-essential, then, and it's just like, it happens every month, you know, and it's infrequent and it's not that essential. Well, okay, you can't hold, you can't then, you know, fire the person because they have a 10 pound uh, lifting, lifting rec- restriction. If the 25 pound requirement is not essential, you can't, you can't hold the 10 pound against them and, and fire them. Same with my, my uncle, clearly, you know, climbing telephone po- poles, um, climbing is going to be essential. Being up there safely is going to be essential. Uh, there's no way to modify around it, but we would look for modifications like getting him a harness, things like that. That's the type of modification or adjustment to his work that, that we are required to do. Uh, again, accommodating applica- uh, applicants. Here's some examples. We've already talked about it. Um, they, the disabled employee might request uh, they can request it at any time. They don't. They could request in the middle of an interview. Um, they could request it, you know, halfway through the, in their third interview, whatever. But they don't have to. Re- there's no specific time that they need to request the accommodation. It can be at any time during the application process. And there are a bunch of examples that I've uh, that I've provided there um, that you can see. Accommodating applicants, in addition to accommodating applicants uh, for the interview, you have to reasonably accommodate qualified applicants to perform the job. So if the applicant in the, in the position, if the applicant during the interview, um, let's, just say, let's just say it's my uncle. We'll go with my uncle example. We're just going to beat this one into the, into the ground. He comes to the interview. He's got one arm. It's pretty obvious he has one arm. So... Um, 
you're thinking in your head, hey, how is a guy with one arm going to climb telephone poles, right? This is, this makes sense. Um, so what you would do is say, hey, here, you know, uncle, uh, my uncle, this uncle's name is John. Okay, so Uncle John, um, I, you know, I want to make sure, you know, essential to the job is that you climb telephone poles. So you got to be able to, you know, climb telephone poles and um, then fiddle with telephone wires up there and do all, you know, do some other essential duties. Uh, are you going to have a problem with that? And if John with one arm, Uncle John with one arm says, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I can do that. I can do that. I might need some accommodation, um, but I, I can do that. And then you say, okay, so let's talk about what sort of accommodation you might need just so we have an, I, an idea of it. I want to make sure, you know, and, and go down this path. So you can have this conversation at the application phase. What you can't do is just automatically assume he's not qualified because he's got one arm. And you don't want to say with employees, hey, so tell me, you know, let's just say it's like any normal employee that just presents, you know, normally four arm, two arms and two legs and all that. Um, and, and you just say, hey, I just want to make sure um, that uh, you don't have any medical issues that, that we need to know about, you know, for climbing towers. Um, anything, anything going, going on there. And at the end, if the person says, you know, you don't want to get into it. So you don't want to ask about medical history for them. You just want to talk about the essential qualifications, the essential duties for the job and see what their response is. And if they respond that, yeah, they can, they can do it. They might need some accommodations. You can go down that, you can go down that road and you can have a conversation about about what it looks like, but again, you can't hold it against them that they want that they might need an accommodation. So in my uncle John's situation, where he's like, "Yeah, there's a $500 uh, harness on the market. I've used it before. It'll work great. We can use it." You can't hold and, and you cannot hold the fact that you might have to purchase a $500 harness for my uncle John so that he can, with his one arm, so that he can climb those telephone poles. Um, you can't hold that against him. Are you always required to grant an accommodation request? No. You have to affirmatively make reasonable accommodations to qualified individuals. Again, Homer's situation, you need to have a PhD in physics. Homer has a master's, he's not qualified. Um, make reasonable accommodations to qualified individuals with disabilities who is an applicant or an employee unless, the, unless you can demonstrate that doing so would impose an undue hardship. So we've talked about a number of situations where it would be like an undue hardship, right? Where um, it would pose a direct threat. So no, you don't always have to grant the accommodation to the employee. You need to, you need to provide reasonable accommodations so that they can perform the essential functions of the job. And you don't, and if, the, and if you can reasonably accommodate them, like my uncle going up the tower, he, he should get graded on the same performance me measurement metric as everybody else. You've accommodated him. He can get up that, that, that uh, telephone pole. He can get up that telephone pole, and he should be graded for performance just like everybody else. You don't give him a special pass because he's got one arm. You don't give him a special pass because you're accommodating him. He can be fired for bad performance just like everybody else. Um, but because, but you've, you've accommodated him, but you don't always have to make accommodations. We've talked about some situations where it, it's undue hardship and direct threat. Okay, let's pivot to the interactive process. What is the interactive process? So you have knowledge, you, you know that the person's got a disability, you have, you're trying to see if they're qualified and now you need to figure out if you can accommodate them, right? So we've talked about it, but this is the process. This is how we do this. We meet with them. We sit down with my uncle. Say he, let's just say my uncle's a current employee and he loses his arm in a farming accident some weekend. Okay, so he loses his arm on Saturday, 
comes in on Monday. He's a, he climbs telephone poles. Comes in on Monday. He's missing an arm. And he's, he says to you, uh, hey, I'm missing an arm. Um, that happened over the weekend. And I'm not entirely sure if I can still climb telephone poles. And then you say, yeah, we're not really sure if you can climb telephone poles either. Why don't you go to your doctor and find out what your doctor says? Doctor comes back. John comes back a few days later. Says, I talked to the doctor. Okay, doctor says, this is, by the way, the process, the interactive process. If you're looking at the bullet points, this is how the interactive process works, right? John brings up he has a medical condition. I then say, I need, we need more information about the restrictions that you have. Go to your doctor, right? That's step two. So John then comes back with medical information and says, okay, yeah, apparently this like loss of an arm, it's going to be a lifelong thing for me. Um, I'm not getting my arm back. And my doctor says that um, maybe with the right harnessing, I could climb towers. We're not sure. And then the, it bounces back to you to make a determination like, oh, okay, um, can we – can I get a harness? So then you start, then you would like go to the internet or go to some safety expert or something like that. And you would try to figure out what these harnesses are and try to figure out what the cost is. And you would try to see, and maybe you have to try out a few harnesses to see if they work for, for uh, John now that he's got one arm. This is, and this might take weeks. This, and in the meantime, John uh, might not be able to work for you. And so you would, you know, he would be off on leave. You don't, you don't need to pay him because he can't work for you right now while you're, while you're freaking out. So you don't have to pay him. Um, it might be unpaid FMLA leave, that sort of thing. But, but you don't have to pay him. You don't have to create light duty for him. But while you're figuring this out, and again, it might take weeks. You might have to bring in some, many, a bunch of harnesses to try it out. And in the end, um, you might find out that there is no, no way to – to, you know, you've tried to implement a number of these accommodations, these harnesses, and maybe none of them work. Maybe none of them are safe enough. They pose a direct threat. And there's no other way that you and John, and you go back, you, re, you go back and repeat the process. Like, okay, well, this harness didn't work. Any other ideas? Yeah, my doctor said, hey, look at this harness from company ABC. Okay, you go and try that one. Then you try that for John. And maybe that, maybe you try that for a couple days and you find out it doesn't work. Go back to the drawing board until all the harnesses are, are tried that are reasonable. If there's a million dollar harness, you don't have to try it because it's unreasonable patently. But, but you try all the reasonable harnesses, all the reasonable ways for, to get him to climb those telephone towers. And if ultimately you've tried everything and you ultimately get to the point where, hey, there's no way for me to accommodate us, us to accommodate you, at that point, you can you know, let, let my Uncle John go. And you could say, hey, you're welcome to apply for any other open positions that we have. Or if you need an accommodation, those positions, we'll explore them then. But, hey, you can't climb telephone poles. Like, there's nothing, there's no way for us to, to get that one, to, to help you with that one. But you've tried. That's the process. Meet, communicate, inquire, get more information, determine, look at the information, analyze it, determine if that works within the job communicate with the employee about the accommodations, brainstorm basically, and then implement the accommodations. And then if the implemented accommodation doesn't get the employee to the point where they're performing, where they can perform the essential functions of the job, do it again until you've exhausted all potential accommodations. There might only be one accommodation that's possible uh, in, you know, for an employee situation, try them all until you've exhausted before you let them go. Um, again, exhaust. Um, so this is, these are the points, just repeating, repeating them um, in a little different uh, slide. So we want to get the information. We want to have this conversation. We want to sit down. This might take weeks. You might try an accommodation and then a month later or three months later or six months later, you find out that, hey, it's not working. And, and you don't get to then say, you know what? We tried. We tried everything. Good luck to you. You're fired. Go apply for another job if you. You got to go back to and repeat the process. You got to go back and say, okay, let's go back and let's see. That maybe there's some new harnesses on the market. It's been six months. Let's go back and see. We've tried all the other harnesses. Let's see if there's another harness on the market. You find another harness. Try that one. Right. Um, try. You rinse, repeat until you've exhausted all options, 
and it might take a long time and it might be really frustrating, but this is what's required of you under the law. Have to do it in good faith. Good faith goes both ways. Clearly, the employer needs to be in good faith like we've been talking about. You need to, you need to um, try to reasonably accommodate the employee if possible, interactive process, all that. Similarly, the employee also needs to engage with you in good faith. So if there is, let's just say there's a harness, and that harness is like, you know, rainbow colors, and my uncle's like, I can't stand rainbow colors. I have an aversion to rainbow. Like, I will not be laughed at by all my coworkers on, uh, you know, neighboring telephone towers. Um, well, if it's an accommodation, and if it's reasonable, and you've put it out there, John doesn't get to, John doesn't get to say no. If it's a potential reasonable accommodation, he has an obligation to try it. If he doesn't, if he refuses, and he's like, no, 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 there's another, there's another uh, harness on the market. Yeah, it's 100 bucks more expensive, but it's, it's brown, and I really like the color brown. John doesn't get to choose. You, as the employer, get to choose. If there's a reasonable accommodation out there, you get to choose which one to try first. If yours doesn't work, then yeah, you go to the next one and you try it. But the employee needs to equally engage with you in good faith and try all the accommodations that are out there. And if they don't, you might get to the point where you're like, hey, like, Uncle John, you got to come in. We've got a harness for you. Like, come on in and do the job. Climb the telephone towers. We want to try this out. And if he's like, nope, I refuse to wear that rainbow colored uh, so-and-so harness, I will not do it. He's like, okay, here's our attendance policy. This is, you're, you're now on an unapproved leave of absence, uh, Uncle John, and you uh, are going to be, you know, we're going to terminate you if you continue to refuse to come into work. That's where you might get because they're in good faith not, um, not interacting with you as well to try to figure out a solution so that they can perform the essential functions of the job. Back to Homer. Unable to physically work at the nuclear power plant, Homer's employer was unclear what to do with him. They need him to push a computer button if the nuclear power plant is going to explode. Homer still wants to work, but can't seem to do it at the office anymore. Maybe, let's just say because of like the mold or something. What should his employer do? Well, you could try to see if there's any way, again, explore it, right? I mean, we want to go through this process. That's the key. So we want to go through the process. You could explore with Homer, um, could you move his button pushing desk off-site? Could you move it to his house? Could he work from home? Could you move it off-site? Would that be reasonable? If Homer, if, the, if it's totally patently unreasonable because, hey, you got to see, you got to be here at the nuclear power plant to push the button, then, and Homer's got, and Homer's physically unable to work there because of the mold or whatever, then, hey, you're out of, he's, Homer's out of luck. Um, you can't, if you can't accommodate him if he can't work at the nuclear power plant and that's where the job is and there's no way around it, then boom, you, you know, you, you're going to have to say just, hey, Homer, sorry, we don't have a job for you. You're not qualified, right? You don't hit that qualification. If it's the type of job, though, where through this conversation, this interactive process, you get more information and you find out, hey, yeah, we could set you up with a work from home arrangement, Homer. Well, and, and if it's not too expensive, uh, too, you know, too unreasonable for you to set him up with a work from home arrangement, you could do it and you would be expected to do it. So, you know, and if you find out like, hey, there's a nuclear meltdown and Homer should have, should have, you know, Homer would have seen it if he were here, but because he's from working from home, he had no idea. He, I guess we didn't think about it. He didn't know that there was a nuclear meltdown. Then, yeah, then that's, then you might find that that accommodation suddenly um, is a direct threat, poses undue hardship, it's not reasonable, and then you can rescind the accommodation because you, you know, find out that it's just not working out. Same with my uncle, if you find out that the harness just isn't working. Okay, uh, when, to, when an accommodation pr pr imposes an undue hardship, so these are the things that I want you to consider in an undue hardship. We don't want to just knee-jerk into an undue hardship, but we want to figure out you know, every, every company, every situation is going, like a hardship is going to be different, right? So like I said before, a million dollar harness 
for an important job at Amazon might not be that big of a deal to Amazon, but for most businesses, um, it's going to be just patently an undue hardship. And, and that's just like, it, we just can't accommodate it. Um, so that might, you know, so we need to do individual assessment to see what the accommodation request is and then understand our business to see if it poses an undue hardship. Um, and again, we look at the cost, we look at the accommodation itself, we look at the person's job, we look at the company's financial situation, we look at resources, we look at you know, the ability to perform the job, we look at all of these different factors. And again, the key for you is that you go through this analysis and not just knee-jerk reaction say, nah, it's just, boy, that's going to be tough. That's going to be too, too difficult for us. You can't do, that's not how, you got to go through this thought process. You got to go through this interactive, um, you know, process, this, this uh, mental game. Examples of reasonable accommodations could be job restructuring. It could even be time off work. It could be modifications. So there's a lot of different things that are unreasonable. Um, holding the job open because the person, we don't know when the person is going to be able to come back to work, that's unreasonable. Like if somebody says, hey, I have no idea what I'm going to be able to come back to work because I'm dealing with cancer, you know, for example, or it's going to be like seven months before I come back to work, well, that's almost always going to be unreasonable if you actually have a need for somebody to do that job. But a lot of these other things could be reasonable. They might be unreasonable, but there are things that we want to look at. So, you know, modification of equipment, like the, you know, bringing in the harness, for example, um, uh, part-time work, restructuring. Uh, we don't have to change the essential functions of the job. We might, be able, we might have to change the non-essential functions of the job, but the essential functions of the job, we never have to change. So climbing towers, we don't need to say, ah, yeah, you know, I know it's a climbing tower job, but let's just do the light duty. We'll, we'll do a light duty. That's not, we don't have to do that under the ADA. There's no light duty um, requirement of us. We just have to, um, we have to make sure that the person can do the, not, the essential functions of the job. And if they can't do the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation, they are, they are um, not qualified for the job and we can move on from them. So these are um, unreasonable accommodations, again, changing the essential functions of the job, lowering productivity or production standards, lowering the, the expectations of the standards of quality. Again, employees with disabilities don't get a free pass. They don't get a lowered bar for expectations. My uncle, even with one arm, needs to be held to the same standard as everybody else. And if he's not doing a great job, if he's not climbing enough telephone poles, and if it's because it just takes too long with the new harness and he's just not as effective, then he should be graded that way and, and disciplined and fired and go down the same performance track that you would go down with any other employee, um, treat him the same exact way. Homer, back to Homer. Homer's been, providing, uh, from, been provided an accommodation to work from home. It, uh, he appears able to do his job pushing uh, a computer key to set, you know, the button to stop a nuclear meltdown, but he was late in doing so once. So what to do, what to do with Homer for failing this one essential aspect of the job? And I think I already kind of uh, jumped, a, jumped a gun on this one and already said it. If you've tried to accommodate him and you find out that the accommodation doesn't work, in Homer's situation, he failed to push the button timely for whatever reason, uh, or you find out that my uncle's harness is not working, like, or it poses a direct threat, like it failed once or something like that, um, then you could go to Homer and say, hey, this isn't working. This, this doesn't work. Like, we needed you to push that button. We ended up having nuclear catastrophe as a result. We needed you to push that button. And so um, y the fact that you weren't able to push the button – this leads us to believe that the work from home arrangement is not working. It's not, it's not working for us. So we're going to have to rescind that. Is there any other way for us to accommodate you? And there probably isn't, right? Cause he's got mold and he can't go back to the nuclear power plant. So that's how you would do it. Again, rinse, repeat, go back and see if there's any other way to accommodate, but you can withdraw the accommodation that you've tried because it's become unreasonable because you found that the person is not qualified because they're not, they're not performing well. 
Would it matter if he failed to push the button because he fell due, due to his disability? And the answer is no, it doesn't matter. Be and it would it have mattered if my uncle fell because the harness broke and um, you know he fell because he otherwise couldn't grab on because he only has one arm? No, you're just trying to accommodate. You tried to accommodate Homer to work from home. That's the accommodation. He fell. That's on. Hi that's on him. You don't need to. Um, you don't need to continue the accommodation and and excuse it. He's. He, it's an unreasonable accommodation because you you found through trial and it, it ended up not working out. I'm not ready for Monday. Uh, may I have another Sunday? Okay. So some of the most unforgettable excuses, these are just thrown in here. These are all real. Um, and these are, you know, not, not uh, good excuses. I thought I'd just kind of throw them in here for, for levity. Um, but, uh, yeah, the employee ate too much birthday cake, not a disability. Um, so yeah, that's not a, not a disability. Um, they call it in Wisconsin. They call it the green and gold flu. When uh, when the Packers when the Packers play on on Monday Night Football and third shift suddenly like everybody gets sick, right? It's like not a disability to have the green and gold flu because you want to stay at home and watch the Packer game um, on Monday Night Football. Okay, when's it appropriate to ask for medical? We're going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so you can ask for medical information when it's job-related and consistent with business necessity, right? So again, if you see that my uncle's got one arm or an employee comes into you and it's related to you know the job of climbing the towers, you can inquire about it. If my uncle comes in and says, yeah, I've got cancer, and you say, hey, is that cancer going to impact your job at all? And my uncle's like, no, I don't think so. And then you say, then that's it. You don't have to go and get medical information uh, from him. But if, the, but if the impairment, physical or mental, has the potential to impact the essential functions of the job, then you can inquire and have the employer, the employee, go to uh, get more information from their medical provider. And so, and we've already kind of talked about this with our, with our um, uh, situations earlier, but for example, you know, employee asks for time off work. They say that they're going to need surgery. Yeah, you can ask them to go get some medical information from the doctor. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Harris has, uh, has forms that, that it would allow you, that you would give to the employee to take to their medical provider. Supervisors should not be ca calling doctors. So it just I, I don't think there's anything in here that says that, but I'm just telling you that supervisors, direct managers should not be contacting medical providers for the employee, employees to figure this out. But if you get, if the employee is starting to indicate that they are having a physical or a mental malady, and so that gives you knowledge, then as part of this accommodation process, you might want to get some more information by asking them to go to their, med their uh, doctor or medical provider to get some information. And you can ask for it in writing too. Okay, and that's pretty much what all these slides are saying. You can also ask these things. Do you need to take a medical leave of absence? You know, what accommodations might you need? A leave of absence is an accommodation. We're just forgetting about the FMLA for now. But under the ADA, if the person has a disability, if they have cancer and they need to go get some cancer treatment, could they, um, would leave of absence qualify for, um, for that? And the answer is yes. Um, would you like uh, me to provide you with FMLA? Okay, so we've got FMLA forms. Was your recent absence due to a medical condition? You can ask for these, this sort of information just to kind of suss out what the basis for why the person was uh, out on a leave of absence. You can ask for a medical note as well, supporting the person's uh, requested accommodation. We've talked about that. What you can't ask is, hey, what are you going to the doctor for? We don't want to pry. We, we only want to ask if it's going to directly relate to the job. Do you have a heart condition? You know, we don't want to ask these direct things. We don't really care what the malady itself is. I, again, I don't really care that it might be cancer. I, what I care about is the impact. I care about the impact on the job. I care about the impact on the employee's ability to do the essential functions of that job. I don't really care what they call it. 
And so that's why we don't want to play doctor because a person might say, oh, yeah, I've got, uh, I've got you know, the flu, I've got the blues or whatever. It's like that. That No, we care about the impact. What, how is this going to impact the, abil- the employee's ability to do the um, essential functions of their job? And is this going to be long, long lasting? And I don't care what they call it. I don't care what the disease is or whatever. I want to know. I want to know if it's long lasting, if it's going to impact one or more of life's major activities and impact the way that they do the job. Things that we should not be asking an employee uh, if they've ever been injured on the job in the past. We never want to ask an applicant that. That is an absolute no-no. Um, have they ever been treated for mental problems? Uh, what prescription drugs are you currently taking? So we don't, you know, we don't want to ask those sorts of things. Again, we want to just find out, can they perform the essential functions of the job? Emily. Not Emily again. Emily for the first time. I think it was Sarah earlier, so Emily, no. Emily comes to you and says that she needs time off work in two weeks for a procedure. After the procedure, she'll probably need another week off work. She doesn't want to get into the details saying it's private. What should you do? So in this situation, again, um, let's just forget about PTO and, and FMLA. Let's just say none of that exists. And so we've got – we don't know if Emily's disabled. We just have no idea. I, so you could say, hey, Emily, we have a leave of absence form. Could you – you know, we'd like to understand um, whether this is covered by our dis- – you know, whether you need an accommodation. You've asked for time off work, but we don't know if this is really covered by an accommodation requirement for us. So if you could go to your doctor – and give us some more information about what the underlying condition is and why you need two weeks off work, that's what we're going to do. So you can ask for more information. In this situation, it's probably not a disability that you would have to accommodate, but because it sounds like it's just a procedure that's only going to last a few weeks, and disabilities are things that last uh, long-term, more than six months. So something that just lasts a few weeks is, is not very likely to be a disability. Okay, Emily. More recently, you've noticed that Emily has been making mistakes in her job, basically not performing as she used to and as you expect her to. She has not asked for any sort of accommodation. You want to talk to her about it, but you're concerned about the cancer issue, right, because she has cancer. That was, the, that was what I was supposed to say from the last slide. Um, okay, so Emily has cancer, and you, you know, she hasn't asked you for anything. How would you handle this? You could go about this a couple different ways. Here's conservatively how I recommend handling it. You don't have to go up to her and say, hey, Emily, I know about the cancer. Uh, Is that why you're really crappy at your job right now? You don't need to do that. So what you could do is say, hey, Emily, just focus on the the impact. The impact is she's not performing her job well. Hey, Emily, I know you're not doing the TPS reports very well uh, right now. I needed 10 TPS reports. And um, you only did like eight of them. Okay, so that's a problem. I needed 10 TPS reports. You only did eight of them. You're too short. I normally suspend people for being too short. Anything, you know, you want to talk about. Now you're going to go suspend Emily because she was too short, right? So you can suspend her. That's fine. But then when she comes back, say, look, Emily, you weren't able to do the 10. Is there anything you need from me? Anything you need... I need you to do the 10, anything you need. And if she at that point says, oh, yeah, the cancer, it's pretty tough. It's slowing down my ability to do these TPS reports. Um, I, you know, if you could get me, if you could move my desk over closer to the fax machine and the printer, that would be great. Um, Okay, that's an accommodation request. If you can do it reasonably, if there's some desk space available, do it. Try it out. See if she can get to the 10 reports. If she gets to eight again, suspend her again, if that's your way you normally do, and then try, you know, get to the point, unless you fire people at that point, she comes back and say, okay, yeah, clearly this accommodation didn't work. I still need you to, to do 10. What else? Any other ideas? And then if Emily has some more ideas, try them out. If not, just say, okay, well, you know, three times you're out. If you don't do the 10 TPS reports this week, I'm going to have to let you go. She's got cancer but you've got the performance expectation. You haven't lowered your performance expectation. She still continue. You've given her a legitimate, you know, the old college try to succeed. You've accommodated her as requested and there's nothing you can do about it. And so if she again fails, treat her like everybody else. And if you fire people after two suspensions, you fire them on the third one, then go for it and, and fire Emily. Emily's really struggling as she goes through cancer treatment. She has proven unable to handle the essential duties of her job, as we were discussing. She indicates that she can't perform the job, and you've tried to accommodate her. What are your options? Well, we already talked about it. 
So she can't perform the job. You've tried to accommodate her. She's unqualified. She is not a qualified person with a disability. Therefore, you can pull the plug and um, send her to go look for for other um, you know openings at the company. But basically, you're you're going to fire her and help see if she's if she can move to any other job opening. One of Emily's key duties is moving heavy boxes. It only accounts for 5% of what she does, but it's necessary for the job. She asked that you assign a box moving duty to one of her coworkers instead. Could you, should you? Could you, you have to, you have to understand whether, you have to examine again, part of the interactive process, individualized examination, examine whether assigning that essential duty makes sense. Now, if it's essential, you don't need to assign it to another coworker. You don't need to hire another person to, you're basically hiring another person to perform that, that job duty. Emily needs to do all of her essential duties. So you don't need to eliminate this essential duty from her job. It's basically eliminated it from her by assigning it to somebody else. So you, even if you could move it to somebody else, you don't need to because the law doesn't require that you eliminate essential duties from somebody's job, uh, even if you technically could. So tips about asking for an employee's medical condition. Again, just generally can't ask to disclose information about a health condition during employment or the application uh, process, but you can ask about medical condition if the condition is affecting the employee's ability to do their job or if it's obvious or if the employee brings, the applicant brings it up during the application process. So again, obvious when my Uncle John comes to the interview with one arm, you can, you can ask to ensure that he can do the essential functions of the job. These are just tips for you in, in the interview process, just to ask narrowly to find questions about the need for an accommodation, and then um, you know, not to directly you know, ask for medical records and stuff like, and stuff like that, um, and not to ask that stuff directly from a doctor that you should, the best practice is to ask the employee to go and obtain that information from the medical provider themselves. So um, commonly asked questions that, that I see, you know, does an accommodation request need to be in writing? No, it doesn't. Um, just needs to be clear. Is the employee obligated to request an accommodation? No, um, they don't have to uh, in, if you can infer it from the circumstances, but, um, but uh, you know, just be mindful of, of that, that you don't have to go in and ask them, hey, you're disabled, would you like an accommodation? You don't have to do that necessarily. You would, um, but employees are, employees do have an affirmative obligation generally, but as an employer, if you see that the employee is struggling and you are curious if it's because of the disability is best practice to go and offer, like open the door to allow the employee to come forward and ask for an accommodation. You don't have to use the words accommodation. You can just ask to make sure that they've got everything that they need to perform and meet the expectations for the job. Is an employer required to provide the exact accommodation request? And the answer is no. You are just expected to provide an accommodation. Uh, so if there are multiple accommodations, you as the employer get to choose them. The employee doesn't get to choose them. Is leave from work a reasonable accommodation? Time off work is a can be a reasonable accommodation. It's one of the accommodations that the ADA looks at. When an employee returns, to work from leave, medical leave, can the employer ask about the employee's medical condition? Uh, n no, you just want to make sure that, now you could do a fitness for duty upon return if you've got uh, a physically demanding job or if, and if that's how you always handle it for that class of workers. So you could do a, f a fitness for duty um, and you could just ensure generally that the employee is uh, released to come to work, but you don't need to ask the employee about, you know, continued medical condition. If they need a continued accommodation, you might, you know, have that conversation with them. But um, once they, they come off of a medical leave, unless they need further accommodation, you don't really need to get into it. But you could make sure that they are uh, allowed to come back, that they're medically cleared to do so and can perform the essential functions of the job. Okay. 90 minutes is up. Um, thank you for your time. I hope this was informative. If you have any questions, please direct them um, to April and I, she'll, she can send them to me um, 
you are always anyway, – otherwise, if she says, you're welcome to reach out to me directly if she wants to as well. That's entirely fine. But I appreciate the opportunity to present this to you. I hope it's been informative for, any, uh, for everybody, and I wish all of you well.